Now, what I'm going to ask you to do during your questions, what I'm going to ask you to do is to put your hand up when you want to ask a question and then tell me which speaker you wish to address your question to, preferably not all four, just a particular speaker. Keep it short and sharp and come up here to the microphone, please. It just that little bit of extra uh, legwork. It's worth it. Come up here and then you'll be recorded on our video. Otherwise, you won't be. Who's the first question? The question, er, uh, nobody? Yes, please. Uh, Victor, I've heard your talk before about a year ago, and I issued you a challenge then. As a scientist and an Australian skeptic, my name is Ian Bryce, I asked you to come up with one piece of evidence for the afterlife. I've, ha I've read your book, and there's nothing in there that stands up at all, just a collection of anecdotes. So have you progressed any any and any, have made any progress at all towards finding an actual piece of evidence that stands up in a scientific sense for the afterlife? Okay, thanks for that. Ian, is it Ian? Right. Thank you. Um, that was a time when we were the humanists, remember? We, right. we were the humanists, yeah. yeah. Um, but that was a time where a few, there were a lot of interjections and I don't know how serious you were. I, I, I thought if you wanted to, to, to for this to be dealt with seriously, you'd meet you'd meet me after the, the meeting, and and you say, okay, could could you do this and that? But but not not during the uh, meeting. To me, as I said to you before, I uh, <coughs> um, uh, as I said to you before. Uh, I'm not doing this on my own. I said to you also uh, during the speech, I, I, I uh, specifically stated uh, there is a concept called the experimental effect, right? And that, that it's difficult for uh, extreme skeptics such as you are to really understand uh, what is really going on with, with 20 areas of uh, Afterlife uh, evidence. I mean, if, you, if you're serious about it, would I, I'd call for for an, uh, a non-aligned adjudicators, those those scientists and others who are able to perceive the the paranormal, with, you know, in a so, in a balanced way, uh, um, because we know from experience, like the case of uh, uh, Schlitz and uh, Richard Wiseman in England, uh, where uh, uh, they had an experiment. The closed-minded skeptic obtained negative results, and and the other open-minded skeptic got <laughs> positive results. Not it was an impossible good. situation. This is why well, you've got to have non-aligned referees. Not a, for for you to be just you and me. It, it is, it's not, a, not a, you need to trust someone who can speak on on your behalf. Someone who can identify. Where the paranormal is successful, we have the scientific method. That's the I, I'm, a, I'm an expert in scientific method. I know what intervening uh, issues to, to to control to to have a, a valid uh, experiment. But the thing is, um, uh, I am honest in what I'm doing. Don't don't impute or imply that uh, I'm not honest in what I'm doing. I, I have some of the most brilliant people on earth who say the same thing as, as, as I'm saying. I can prove it without any doubt. If you want to pursue this, okay, I'm more than happy to pursue it, but you need to have a referee that is not as closed-minded skeptic as you are. We need someone who, who if the evidence is there, they say, it's yes, it's there. If it's not, they say, no, it's not. One piece of evidence, that's all I ask. Why not? In 1704, Isaac Newton published his second book, Optics. In the foreword, he wrote, and I like to hear the response of all four speakers, since it is totally relevant to what they should have discussed tonight. Isaac Newton wrote, It seems probable to me that in the beginning, God made the atoms, a scientist, 
Let's hear your opinion. Um, this is a crucial turning point in the history of ideas. Um, so, you know, this is what I call the, uh, the baptism of atomism. It was a very difficult thing for Christian scientists to do since most of the atomists, particularly the pre-Socratics, okay, so you've got Democritus and Leucippus, uh, they, they don't seem to be uh, prepared to commit themselves to um, any kind of monotheism and uh, they believe that fundamentally the universe is there by chance. The Democritus did say, strangely, all things are God, so he has his residual understanding of the divine. Um, but by the time we get to Lucretius, of course, atomism is formulated in such a way that um, it looks um, as if a world of chaos and disorder are being propounded, and Newton's move, which is a difficult move for him, uh, was to discover um, among non-Epicurean, non-atomistic thinkers beliefs about atoms, which you'll find, for example, in Stoic physics, um, and, and then get rid of the disturbances, the anxieties that scholars previously had about atomism and go ahead uh, to, to incorporate it into uh, cosmology. So it is, it is a turning point. Uh, so I, I'm only commenting on it in the history of ideas because I have written quite a bit about Newton's uh, cosmology. And, uh, you know, good American scholars have documented this transition in Newton's works as well, apart from optics. I hope it helps anyway. Okay, I'll answer it just very briefly. Uh, you want a statement of... Um, of actually a credo of a belief. I think it is a non-question. I think it is a spiritually dishonest question because it is to elicit a statement of ideology. Isaac Newton himself was a thaumaturge and wrote 52 theses on the occult. And for him to be asked about um, the junction of Christianity and empiricism, it's asking somebody who was on the cusp of a feeling of ambience to an empiricism to make a statement that we must agree with. I agree with all and no statements because all and no statements are seen in context wasn't worth standing up to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, um, I'll give you a quick, quick comment. I see Newton's work as falling into three categories. Uh, he pursued a number of theories with very useful results, especially uh, optics and gravity, things like that. He pursued many theories that uh, turned out not to stack up, such as his work in alchemy and things like that. And there's nothing wrong with checking something out and deciding, well, it doesn't work. Uh, he also had a lot of strange ideas. Um, he not only believed in God, but he believed that God had singled him out to reveal many, many truths to humanity. Uh, and those kind of things were the products of his imagination in the sense that I discussed earlier. Just very briefly, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I uh, won't respond in a microcosmic I'll, I choose to use in a macrocosmic about Newton, uh, especially in context of t tonight's topic, God. Now, uh, Sir Isaac Newton was in, into optics, mechanics, and m mathematics. Now, Newton was a figure of undisputed genius and innovation, and to quote himself, because he accepts there's a divine being, not through beliefs, but through his work, he says, the most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. David. And um, my question is, um, with the replacement of um, religious or spiritual um, beliefs, 
with things like um, isms, communism, or you know, um, a keenness on climate change or animal rights or something like that, what values and benefits do you see, have been, if any, have been lost in replacing religious and spiritual beliefs with those? I started with Facebook in February. And I'm amazed at the number of selfies and the number of cat photos we see. It's as if people are trying to identify themselves by the number of clicks they have to their own physiognomy. But there is in Facebook a general feeling of the sort of pagan feeling for Gaia, that something's wrong with the earth. And we're in a building where parliamentarians will take 160-year-old farms away for three years of fracking and farmland can't be replaced. These are people of faith. They believe that after they have gone, their great-grandchildren will be saved because a scientist will find a solution. I tend to feel that the Christians and the Jews and the Muslims have been responsible for dreadful things. There are biblical passages that supported the dominion over the earth for slavery and God help us for prostitution. These are all biblical and give permission for it. I actually think honest, decent people with a feeling of fairness, come to truth. Now, the reason he pointed at me is that I spend half of every year in Moscow and have done so for a long time. And in every direction in Moscow, there is a church. And I have a friend, Genry Norman, who's a plasma physicist and an atheist, but he contributed to the building of the, the Bank of Christ the Saviour. Oops, the Church of Christ the Saviour. Um, <laughs> because it was part of Russian culture. And to be honest, if there are church... Hey, look, I was up in the Hunter in the weekend... No, last week, in the middle of the week, and you can see small communities with gigantic convents, schools, and cathedrals that were built long before people had proper housing, that they built churches and schools hoping to get the Irish nuns to come. Do you know what I mean? So that um, you can say that people of faith do bring about change. But in Russia, they were so suppressed that it's wonderful to go into McDonald's in the week after Easter, when between 12 and 2, the little bells in the church, their tiny bells, they're rung. And you can hear the whole city. And you go into McDonald's and they don't say, have a nice day but they say Christ has risen. And you say, he is risen indeed. I don't care whether they believe it or not, or I believe it or not. I think it's a wonderful exchange. But my great hope is not that everybody goes to my friend Bishop Alexander and feels something when he gives a blessing, but I hope that people will do the right thing for our grandchildren because the world is in great peril if we continue the way we are going. The divine does not make intervention. When the so-called water into wine took place, Christ apologized. He said, my time hasn't come. It happened in spite of me. There, the miracle is when a mum with a Down syndrome grows old looking after the child. That is the miraculous. We shouldn't expect the thaumaturgic. It is up to us to do things systematically. And I think whether you've been a communist, a Republican, a Democrat, or whatever, there's still a sense of truth and a sense of decency in spite of the religions. They give us a duty to conserve what we've got.
Do you wish to follow this up? Trump. Yes, please. Well, that, that's a very hard act to follow. <laughs> but, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make uh, one apparently pedestrian point because Chris and I have these interesting interchanges. Um, part of the problem of uh, doing um, the history of ideas is reification, uh, where you take bundles of things like animal rights or EI hypothesis or Christianity, you know, and you treat them as entities, as if they do things, when in fact it's only the people who hold views within these so-called systems who do anything. Uh, even though you might feel some kind of pressure in yourself or ambience around these um, ways of thinking about the world. So part of the problem with the question itself is, um, you know, what it assumes. There's so much overlap these days between people's views and where they sit in relation to what they see is talked about on Facebook as these entities like animal rights, human rights and so on in relation to religion, that uh, you, you can't really generalize. But I think we all take the point that <clears throat> we are in a world of um, what look like surrogate religions these days. That's to say, you know, we kind of feel we're in a post-religious situation, but we can't really get away from, you know, <laughs> what we've been used to calling um, religions as, say, um, sources of ultimate meaning, let's say. Um, and, um, you know, I take up uh, the professor's point here that it's very, very easy now in this post-religious situation to look negatively back on what might be left behind as uh, not not good enough and we're going to move in a vision uh, however secular it may look uh, to something better in the future but as you've guessed from my uh, work there are incredible treasures uh, in the um, you know, in the great bodies of tradition that have been left over by humanity. And sometimes I feel that a failure to go back to ancient wisdom and our tinkering around with these isms is missing the point. Even though I would agree that terrible tragedies have occurred with those traditions. I mean, I can't stand the jati or caste system of Hinduism, for example even though I, I love to hear a poem about Brahman. I agree with uh, the great uh, mystic Pegui in France that maybe Christianity as a system has had it. You know, at times I said, sort of, oh, really, what has it come to? But then when I <laughs> read into the tradition, I get re-inspired. So just, just to get a feel of all the methods that have to be applied there, they're part, of, they're part of science. They're part of Wissenschaft in the German sense. And you have to know these things because very often, for example, natural philosophers and scientists will reify like hell when it comes to society and beliefs. And they don't know what they're talking about. Whereas, you know, me, when I get into mathematics, it's, it's chaos. It's not chaos theory, it's just chaos. <laughs> Yes, we're here to contemplate the riddle of life because uh, we all ask the big questions why are we are here, where do we come from, and where are we going? Now, when you look at this building here, it exists. Did it make itself or did somebody build it? If somebody built it, that means there's an intelligence behind this building. Look around all these books here. They didn't create themselves. Somebody wrote the books and somebody printed them. This building here was made according to a blueprint. Some architect created a blueprint and then tradesmen built this building in accordance with the blueprint. There's intelligence in this building. It didn't create itself. 
Now, when you look at your own lives, you have your past, the present and the future. You know you have a past because you remember it. And you have a present because you experience it right now. It's self-evident. You don't have to ask somebody else if you're here or not. You know you're here. But what about the future? Is there a future? We don't know because we haven't experienced it. But you know from past experience, when you wake up in the morning, there is a future. Now, skeptics, atheists, materialists, don't want to believe that there is a future when it is self-evident. Your own experience will tell you that there's a future. If there's no future, then there's no reason for you to be here. There's no purpose to life. Why is it that atheists, materialists, want to deny their own future? If you don't have a future, then you have no reason for being here. You announce that? There seem to be a number of questions inherent in all of that. I'm not sure how the metaphor of this building, which has obviously been designed and built, uh, pertains to the idea of whether we have a future. Uh, firstly, I'll say that sceptics and atheists and materialists are not synonymous. There are plenty of sceptics who believe in, in God. Um, our organisation has some members who are like that. Scepticism is a series of techniques that you can use to analyse things. So I know Christians, some of them just take somebody else's word for it. They're quite gullible people. And others want to check everything out for themselves. And, and I ad often admire the extent to which they will study the Bible in, even in Greek and Hebrew to get to the truth. So you can be a sceptic and also believe in, in God and, and any religion. And also being an atheist and a, and a materialist, well, I'm not quite sure of the exact definitions of those words. But uh, as to having a future, I certainly hope I have a future. I hope I have some further future on this earth. Uh, the simple fact that I uh, accept that when I die, that will be it, um, uh, is, is, I think, just being realistic. Um, I hope um, that will come um, a, long, a long way from now. Um, as Woody Allen said, I'm not afraid of death, I just don't want to be around when it happens. Uh, <laughs> And, and I hope uh, I, I live to see plenty of things. I mean, one, one um, perhaps when I was younger, I was a little bit nihilistic, but since I became a gardener, I realised that when you want to try something new, you've got to wait until the next autumn or spring, summer to see whether it's worked. And um, that's one reason why I would like to live a long time, to see whether some of my experience can, can work out. Uh, I remember hearing that there's a Greek saying, I can't tell you what it is in Greek, but it translates as, May you live to be a hundred. And I heard a person commenting on this and said, Why would, who would want to live to be a hundred in this society? And my answer to him was, well, someone who's 99. <laughs> so I can assure the gentleman that uh, being a sceptic is certainly not incompatible with the idea of hoping for a future. Uh, because I don't believe in souls, I accept that when I, when I die, that's it. But that's just being realistic. It's not because I don't. And as for the, I think your question was, well, if I don't believe in life after death, What's the point of being here? Um, I feel a certain, um, I, I sometimes um, pose the, the hypothetical, what if, what if someone um, met me in the street and was going to attack me or something like this? Um, I've had this thought going through places like Redfern at night. What, what if some indigenous person came and said, you, you rich fat bastard with your suit, you know, um, give me your wallet, blah, blah, blah. I, I hate people like you. So I could say, look, mate, I've got two things in common with you. Uh, I was born here in Australia. In fact, I was born in Surrey Hills. Maybe you were too. And the other thing was, I didn't have any choice about it. Here I am. So I accept that my view is um, we're here thanks to our parents loving each other very much um, in a special way, and we've got to make the best of it. And the fact that we think that when we die in a physical sense, that's it, doesn't stop us making the best of it and doing something useful with our lives. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, my question to you is, if, if you assume there are experiences in life that's worse than death, where do you draw the line for the need to believe as opposed to 
human suffering. So I mean, can't you just... Yeah, sorry, could you repeat that? I didn't quite hear. If you assume that there are experiences in human life that are worse than death, where do you draw the line for the need to believe as opposed to needless suffering? Um, I, I'm not sure that I understand the question. I'll, I'll do my best and perhaps we can chat later on and I'll give you a better answer. But I, I do agree with the idea that um, there can be things worse than death. Um, ongoing suffering is, is one of them. Uh, I've thought a lot about suffering and it's one reason why I cease to, to be a Christian. And I see um, a lot of um, a lot of Christians basically rationalising uh, all the suffering in the world. And when I say rationalising, I mean coming up with unconvincing explanations. And what I think they are doing is basically trying to explain a world that behaves exactly the way it would behave if there were no God present at all. So when <clears throat> when we see some of these terrible things that happen. Uh, such as uh, the birth of a deformed child. Now, an atheist can say, well, one day we might be able to work out how that happened. It might have been some congenital deformity. It might have been a, you know, a chemical problem, a disease, whatever. Um, we don't need to explain why that happens. A believer needs to explain why a loving God would bring into the world a baby that is going to suffer for, for all of its short life, not to mention the suffering of the people that have to that experience this. Now, the, the rationalisation from a religious person of that kind of problem is, well, God has done it to um, inspire feelings of love and affection in those who are close to this poor infant. Uh, another, another great example is when you... Is the sort of thing we don't have here, thankfully, but in the States, how many months is it between ho these horrible schoolyard shootings where someone gets into a school and, and, and blows away 5, 10, 15 children and a few teachers, this sort of thing. And I've heard no less a person than William Lane Craig say, well, um, these sort of things could be God's way of promoting further discussion of gun reform. Um, and what William Lane Craig says in answer to all of these kind of questions is we just have to, we believers, be, believers like him, not like me, we have to accept that God has a morally sufficient reason for all these examples of suffering. We just have to accept that God is a moral, because otherwise it doesn't make sense. And to me as an atheist, it makes a lot more sense just to say God is not there. And sometimes I like to pose, I like to pose the question to believers. Um, just imagine God said, look, I'm going to take some time off. Uh, it could be a week, could be a few months. I'm not going to tell you how long, and I'm not going to tell you when it starts, and I'm not going to tell you when I get back. How would you actually know when he's gone and when he gets back? What, what would make the difference? And just one more minute, uh, Dave. Um, the answers you get are things like, well, prayers wouldn't be answered anymore. Um, the answers are not only unconvincing, but they are all things that are products of the human imagination. Prayers will not be answered anymore. They're not answered most of the time already. Uh, I've got a, a Jewish friend who's in the skeptics, and he says, well, what they believe, lapsed Jewish, I should say, they believe, Jewish people believe that all prayers are answered. It's just that the answer is usually no. Uh, <laughs> the, idea, the idea that if God went on holiday, prayers will not be answered does not help because most of them are not answered already. Um, the idea that, uh, okay, people's lives are transformed through the power of Jesus or the Holy Spirit, um, and that wouldn't happen if, if they were on holiday. That might be an answer. But um, these transformations, I suggest, are a classic example of the operation of the human imagination in what can be a useful way. If you're at rock bottom, if you think you're a piece of human garbage, it is, is a great idea, it is a, even a useful delusion to think that you've got a chance to wipe the slate clean, to start again, and even if you keep making boo-boos, you'll be forgiven for those as well, and you can even perhaps do something good for somebody else. This is a hugely useful and transformative product of the human imagination, which someone less charitable like Richard Dawkins would say, this is a hugely useful delusion. So... Um, when I say to these people, how would you know that, that God was on holidays? Their answers don't pass my test of, of being things that couldn't be attributable to the human imagination in any event. Um, so those are, that's a summary of my views about suffering. I'll just say one more thing very briefly. The people that, the believers that can come up with, uh, with rationalizations for human suffering cannot 
ever answer my question about why is there so much animal suffering out there in the world? And I don't mean a few battery hens um, or, or a few pigs in, in factory farms, even though these are things that must be addressed. I'm talking about the enormous amount of suffering that is going on out there um, behind our backs, millions, billions of animals chomping each other, fleeing, running away, hiding, whatever, suffering in various ways, disease. Um, there is just simply no moral point to any of that. It is not instructive in, in, in any possible way. Um, Christians can't explain it. At least I've never heard a, a half useful explanation for that. Um, but to to um, someone like me, you, you can just accept that that's the way nature is. Um, and it, it can be tough for animals and we do what we can to minimise the suffering of those we have contact with. But the world is red in tooth and claw. We see the rise of the Gaia religion, which is basically neo-paganism. Uh, in your experience with examining other cultures and their, uh, how religion is in their culture, uh, how would you rate the pagan-type cultures uh, as against those who believe in a spiritual god in terms of their uh, cultural and scientific progress? Okay, so... This is the area of new religious developments. And um, so we talk about neo-paganism and we are, we are reifying it here because we you know we, we hear about it as a, as a vast movement, but of course it's, it's very fragmented and it's many things. Uh, so, uh, you know, you, you, you've got... Uh, trajectories within it. Sometimes Gaia might not be present, but saving the Earth anyway would be um, like a black elk kind of response. Uh, so other lines of neo-paganism, Jim Butats, for example, on uh, the ancient um, um, sort of Danubian civilization, which was for her, her uh, patrilineal, uh, 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 matrilineal and matriarchal. And so the, the, the threat is that, you know, we should return to the feminine because we've been dominated for so long and neo-paganism is essentially returning to um, life under the, the, the great mother. Um, so there, there are different threads. That's my first reaction would be that you'd have to read what I've said about <laughs> the lines of neo-paganism or perhaps uh, research under Professor Cusack, my colleague on these matters, uh, because um, it's, it's, it's a big subject. However, to answer your question about its significance, um, in my modelling, um, natural religion which is what everybody in the past has needed, will never go away. And I don't want to reify natural religion, but just to kind of give you a feel that there are myriads of these traditions that I've been talking about that lie at the base of the development of the big ones. And most of the big ones are counteracting those energies that came from uh, the small fry. And I tend to specialise a lot in the small fry. So, for example, Zarathustra, the Buddha, Mahavir, the founder of Jainism, they'd be against, like, um, animal sacrifices. Because in the past, masses of animals are, are killed in the old Iranian and old Vedic religious systems. Masses of them uh, with... Uh, with Rajas in India, that's the original meaning of it, supervising and paying off those people, particularly the priests who would put on those sacrifices. So <clears throat> you've got the problem here then of earlier paganism being associated with things that are far from, you know, animal, animal welfare-ish. It's a bit more like me, the shock I had when I documented uh, a giant pig kill in Papua New Guinea with hundreds of pigs bumped on the head because they love to eat pig with the, with the blood in it. You know, they're all lined up. I just couldn't believe how many. And I, 
I, I, I was witness to that. And, and but that is that is part of the spirit of the sacrificial um, uh, kind of hinterland behind everything. We are not living in that world. Remember when I told you about Octavian and all the all the gods that become the demons? We don't want to live in the world of all this messy sacrifice anymore. Is what the the Christian is saying. And my friends, we're not living. We don't, we have abattoirs, but we don't go to temples and see you know priests who have to slit the, the throat of the animals quickly, except in maybe or Jewish and Islamic bathrooms. You know? So uh, re remember <coughs> that, that there are complexities here. So also, you know, um, Jesus, but before him, the prophets are really saying, you know, what's, what's all this sacrifice for? You know, it's a pure heart. It's a turning point that's going on within Judaism. And Jesus is the prophet, really, of the smashing of Israel where the temple is going to go. Not one stone will be left upon another. He's, he's the guy who senses it's all going to come down. And that's one of the most authentic sayings of Jesus, by the way, in critical scholarship, that there wouldn't be one stone upon another. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you get the sense that <coughs> Zarathustra, the Buddha, Mahavir, Jesus, they don't like violence so they don't like war and yet you know all these tribal energies uh, of warriorhood cultures because i've documented uh, old paganism in terms of warriorhood cultures um they're really going to produce the empires of antiquity epitomized by rome where really you know, there are two words that, that, that just put it so simply that they never go away, unfortunately. And that is prosperitas, where you have to have economic riches, fecundity, the women getting pregnant, and victoria, you've got to beat your enemies. And that is a kind of <laughs> symbolic of how you gather up tribal energies into an empire. And... You see, really, the whole life of Jesus is set against this. The whole of the crucifixion is a statement against it, really. And yet it never goes away. I mean, these words, prosperity and victory, could be on the lips of George Bush II, just at a moment's notice. So when we talk about paganism, what are we talking about? I mean, Padlia would say paganism is Hollywood. There are many threads. Um, and as David Hume said, really, can you have the old paganism if what I've just said, for example, is true? Can pagans who see in it such peace and mercy for the earth be the old pagans when they say this? Of course they can't. It has to be neo-paganism. But as neo-paganism, it's, it's, it's a nice timely reminder of the nonsense, the unenvironmental decimating morass that has been created by us moderns. So I think we need to hear it. Because we have to have, we have to have, how can I put it this way? Look, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an ecumenical Christian open to these other things because I set, I set very strong basic standards. Okay. They're simply that I commit myself to love as unconquerable goodwill. You take that point? And as soon as you say that, anything that's unloving falls as the last, it falls into the last judgment of love. You say, oh, well, that's crap then. If, if people are fracking, you know, so to, just to make money, when well, the earth is so good and we need it, you know, then obviously it's unjust. So <laughs> peace with justice is another high standard. You know, truth with critical probing. You know, obviously, I feel my standards about you know, searching for truth have to encompass the spiritual domain. Otherwise, it's what we call privative. It doesn't allow what's obvious in the existential dimension of the human life. If you deprive yourself of the spiritual dimension, well, gee, you're dehumanizing yourself. I'll challenge you on that one. 
Anyway, I go on and on with, with, with these standards because if you don't have those, how can you actually do critical scholarship and live well at the same time? It's impossible. Hello, my name is Nick. I'm from Eastern Europe, Macedonia. And um, I heard that a lot of the countries in the eastern part of that uh, um, um, homeland of ours uh, have um, a revival of the faith and uh, not just a belief in God, but people just um, naturally get um, together and they have this uh, wonderful um, gathering as a group and they become a nation once again, each of the each of those uh, folk of the eastern part of um, 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 uh, okay, um, Europe. I wanted to know um, what do you think of that and how do you see it uh, developing in um, Russia and um, all over the world in that sense of revival of faith? Thank you, sir. Um, it's a question I actually don't like. Because with the revival of faith, you get the splitting into sub shards of denominations and faiths. There's a world of difference between the Croatians and the Serbs, for example. I actually think that we are bigger than the way we go about things. Look, why is it there is any ritual? You see, what happened is that somebody has had an experience of something. And when it doesn't happen the next time, you make a ritual trying to evoke it. And the religions, whether it's orthodoxy, Catholicism, or whatever, are different ways, according to the folk soul of the people, if we're going to get into a Jungian stand, um, of approaching a way of getting close to something. As to what's happening in Russia, um, I always worry about church attendance. High church attendance is accompanied by higher rates of bigotry often. And the feeling that God is on our side was on the belts of both the English and the Germans in the First World War. I think that the great religions are really about a questioning inside of yourself and in a questioning about something bigger rather than ritualistic forms. But you go to the rituals that suit your way of getting access. Can I ask myself a question and answer it briefly? The question is, David, do people who are religious have easier deaths than people who are not religious? Who thinks religious people have easier deaths? Who thinks they don't? Yeah. You see, the best human being I've ever met was Tom Coomba, and he had the worst death I've ever known. The more religious you are, the more you are not conscious of guilt, but you're conscious of, for I have left undone those things which I ought to have done. Religious people, in their inner dialogue, keep on saying to themselves, but I should have done this. Why didn't I do that? And that, for me, is reason enough to have a religious war, that one consciously questions motives right to the end. Aristotle's definition of a human being. You see an eagle, you can define an eagle, but a human being you can only define it as somebody who learns from birth right through to death and somebody who's capable of changing their mind at any stage in life. I don't think Christians, Jews, Hare Krishnas that I've been with, Orthodox, Catholics, as with a Catholic arch, a Catholic bishop once, um, I think they have a harder death, because no matter what Christ they believe will forgive them, do they forgive themselves? Because our crimes are against people. 
which is reflected in the Godhead. It's the people we worry about that we've harmed and what we haven't done. I answered that question well, didn't I? <laughs> okay, the witching hour. The last question from somebody who said nothing. Who might that be, please? Is there going to be a... Right at the back, come up and tell us who you wish to question. No, did you say everyone? No, I said that was a good one. Thank you. Your question. Thanks, thanks David. My question is to um, Mr. Martin. And it is this, you uh, said that uh, when you die, that's it. Would you mind telling the meeting how you reached that conclusion? And does uh, your position negate everything that Professor Samet said about people on the other side? That's it. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, one thing um, that uh, is integral to the ethics of the sceptics is that uh, whenever we're asked a difficult question, we, we're against the idea of doing anything to distract the audience or uh, give the impression that we have greater authority than we otherwise would have. Um, so let me answer it this way. Uh, my conclusion about not having a soul that persists after death uh, is a result of uh, the sort of deliberations I described earlier and deciding that the soul cannot exist separately from the body. It is something that we have created through our own imagination and through our own yearnings. Um, when I consider the sort of evidence or so-called evidence that people like Mr Zamet come up with, um, I find myself asking questions like, if it is um, easy to, or if it's possible to communicate with the afterlife, why do we get the sort of messages we get? Um, a sceptic can see that there's a difference between someone, but between a message that appears to come from the afterlife, from someone saying, I was a passenger on MH370, and I can tell you what happened, and I can tell you where the plane is. There's a difference between that and someone like John Edwards, these um, paid entertainers, who says, I've um, been in touch with your grandmother, and she says she's quite proud of you, but she would like you to lose a bit of weight. Um, <laughs> most of the messages that we seem to get from the afterlife are that kind of, uh, frankly, drivel. And um, there's a lot of uh, in, there's been a lot of investigative work into so-called sciences and mediums and things like that, and those uh, demonstrations just don't stack up. So on the one hand, I have my um, my analysis of why people do believe in the soul. My conclusion that I I wish it were true, but I think it probably isn't. I I'm not certain about that, but I'm fairly confident of it. And um, that does tend to fall into line with our experiences and and what is uh, what we find when we scrutinise those who say there is an afterlife and we're getting messages from it. Thank you, David. Um, with great respect to you, Martin, I mean, uh, you can't use this smorgasbord argument. That is, you pick only things that, that support your case. I mean, and, and ignore other things that, that, that sh show you you're, you're not right. Uh, skeptics were wrong before. Closed-minded skeptics were, were wrong before. Very, very wrong on major, major things. Perhaps uh, someone... Uh, like Martin and other atheists, if they're honest, I'm sure they're, they're honest about what would they uh, b b think about. Are uh, you know, are honest about it. But can I just remind you of the times when the, the extreme skeptics really, really viciously attacked? Let me tell you uh, those uh, uh, others who who made uh, um, very important claims, extraordinary claims, as Carl Sagan said, need extraordinary e evidence. We, we cannot forget where Scientific Americana, New York Times, the New York Herald, uh, some of the army generals and the chief of the uh, uh, academics, professor of mathematics and astronomy, Simon Newcomb, from John Hopkins in University, uh, <coughs> all heaped derision, ridicule and denigration onto the Wright brothers, claiming it was scientifically impossible for machines to fly. 
They were wrong. Right? Now, it's possible that these, these atheists are wrong. The other one was, what about when John Logie Baird uh, was attacked? He, he, they, they said to him, it was absolute rubbish that television waves could produce a picture. <laughs> we know the history. So they were wrong as well. The, uh, the other one was Sir William Priest, uh, uh, who said uh, about Ed Ed Edison's invention, uh, the lamp, that's a uh, parallel circuit, was a completely idiotic idea and wanted to remain uh, uh, using gas for, 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 for his light. It just shows you, shows you, that, that some of the uh, extreme skeptics are wrong in their beliefs, and they've got to accept not the evidence they choose to, to, to you know, to show it's, uh, it's not happening, but the evidence of some brilliant scientists uh, and other writers, like uh, Arthur, uh, um, Arthur Finlay, for example, r r uh, read his book on the edge of the etheric. You know, he, he was as close-minded skeptics until he experienced himself making contact with the other side. He, he was absolutely stunned, right? And, and not only that, let, let me tell you some of these closed-minded doctors who in the 50s were saying uh, they were giving their patients who had sore throats. For your patients uh, with sore throats and coughs, uh, you must use uh, Philip Morris cigarettes. Here it is. Okay? And and I, uh, and this is on, on the internet. Here is a, a, a pictures of doctors in g glossy m magazines, you know, saying, "I I smoke Camel. Camel's the best cigarette of them all." You know, it's a lot of you know nonsense. They have to be honest. They have to investigate the 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 uh, uh, those brilliant scientists who said, "Yes, I was a sci I was skeptic too." But after investigation, I have I have to. I have to concede, yes, there is an afterlife. <laughs> okay, it's been a grand evening and you have lived up to the best tradition of the Roundtable Forum.